anyways, it's my great, um, well, first of all, welcome to our first um, Equity Institute for 2019-20, um, and it's being sponsored through the California One, our um, Highway to Success Equity League grant that we have, and we're in our second year. And uh, we heard a lot about, we want more disability awareness, more ways and uh, tools for people and staff to take to school sites to work on empathy, uh, disability awareness, um, and creating that culture of welcoming and belonging. So Sam Drazen is here all the way from Vermont. Isn't that awesome? They probably have um, leaves that are turning. Not quite Not yet, quite but though. getting close, getting um, close. So at any rate, Sam is the CEO of Changing Perspectives, which is this wonderful organization that you will learn all about, da, 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 that he will share with us today. And there's lots of great resources that we're hoping to expand and bring to Santa Clara County. And I am excited to have everybody here. So with that, I'm going to turn Thank it over you. to Sam. Great, thanks. Oh wait, before I spell, I'm sorry. Has anyone ever seen a disability awareness calendar? Ooh, so in your folders, when you come, there could be a raffle ticket, and you might win one of these before today. Um, we're lucky to have Christine Batista here. She is the creator of this, and it has the different um, definitions, common educational challenges, and teaching uh, tips, and it's a great um, resource. So she will share a little bit at the end, and um, if you have an orange ticket in your packet, you might have won one. Okay, now I'm gonna go. All thank right, you. thank you. Thank you, Kathy, for that Welcome. enthusiastic introduction. Um, good morning, everybody, and thanks for having me. Um, as Kathy said, my name is Sam Drazen. I live in Vermont, um, and Kathy and I connected probably two years ago, I would say now, um, and this summer as she was planning these equity institutes, she'd asked me if I would be willing to come um, and present at one. So I'm honored to be here today. Um, we're gonna cover a lot of different things uh, this morning. I wanna tell you a little bit about changing perspectives in the organization that I run to help bring disability awareness programming to schools. There are these little brochures up here. Um, so if you wanna learn more, I invite you to take one. Um, we're going to talk about what is disability awareness, why it's important now more than ever before. We're going to really unpack empathy and talk about what's the difference between empathy and sympathy. And then what I'm going to try to do is allocate probably a good 15 or 20 minutes towards the end of the morning to give you kind of like a workshop time. Um, in your uh, green folder, there are two handouts. There's one that has a packet um, with some information that I've kind of pulled from the slideshow, some activities I'm gonna ask you to do, and then there's a green piece of paper that just has a, I think it's called Disability Awareness in Action chart. And that's gonna be a chart that I'm gonna ask you to take some time later on this morning and just fill out and really, um, you know, my hope is that you leave here today with new tools, new ideas, new resources, that you can take back to your schools or your school sites and really start to begin to implement disability awareness uh, right away. So let's see why this has gone black now. I always say that no presentation is complete without some sort of technical error. So hopefully so we've done it. Check. that was it. That was so it. now it's going to work perfectly. Um, so let me tell you uh, a little bit about myself. All right, two technical errors. Is it not working? Let's see here. There we go. We'll just do it that way. Um, so I am a former elementary educator. I taught third grade for a number of years, and before that I taught fifth grade um, in a public school in Vermont. And I left the classroom about five years ago to take this kind of leap of faith and leave the steady paycheck as a classroom teacher and start something new. Um, so now I do one of two things. One, I'm the CEO and founder of Changing Perspectives. Um, and I also travel at more of a national level and present to schools, to students, to educators around the issues that we're here to discuss today. And what I'd like to do is 
take a few minutes to kind of tell you my journey and my story about why I left teaching and how I ended up in this role. Because we're here to talk a little bit today about empathy and empathy is built on human connection and helping us understand our own story. So to do that, I wanna share with you a little bit of a story about myself um, to start to build kind of that empathy and that connection amongst us. So I had this idea for creating some sort of entity to bring disability awareness to schools for a few years. And so the school I was teaching at, I put on an event called Disability Awareness Day, which was a one and done, you know, we set up the gym, we had stations, we had parent volunteers come in, students came through the gym, we created a schedule where they rotated through these disability awareness activity stations, little hands-on simulations. And the feedback I got from parents, from teachers, from students was really positive. And everyone was saying, this is great, this is great, this is great. So I started thinking, okay, there must be something else that we could do. So it was kind of like one thing that happened. Simultaneously, the book Wonder came out. Can you just raise your hand if you're familiar, familiar with that? All right, most of us are. So the book Wonder came out around the same time. And Wonder is the story, a fictional story, about um, a boy who has a craniofacial anomaly. Um, and I was also born with a very similar craniofacial or facial difference anomaly. to a school or a community organization and share my story um, and talk about what it was like growing up as a student with a difference, talking about my facial surgeries and my hearing aid. And again, teachers were saying, okay, this is great, but it's one hour. We want more. So between a couple of those things happening around the same time, the gear started to turn and I started to think there must be something here. And then there was kind of a, a pivotal moment when I was teaching. Um, so one of the years that I was teaching, I was teaching third grade at the time, I had a student in my class who um, was diagnosed with apraxia. So she was third grade, eight, nine years old, but cognitively more like three, four, year old, four years old, nonverbal. Um, and I was talking to her mom one day and, you know, it was a very small town in Vermont, you know, K-6 school with you know, not maybe 160 kids. So it's pretty small, everybody knows everybody, right? And I was talking to the student's mom and I said, you know, I think it would be really great if we were able to share a little bit more about your daughter with the rest of the class. And she said, yes, like I would love to do that. Because what do we condition kids to do? It's like, don't point, don't stare, don't ask questions, just focus on yourself, do your thing, right? And this student was, I would say physically included in our classroom, but not authentically included in our classroom, right? She had her own little desk in the corner of the room with bookshelves around it where she and her one-on-one -on -one para stayed, right? And I would say that that, you know, we could argue that's inclusion, but it's not what I would argue authentic inclusion. So one morning meeting, we, uh, we had the students in a circle and I kind of went over some ground rules. I said, you know, we're gonna talk about something that stays in our family, you know, our classroom community and it's kind of private and we want to be respectful and all of that. And then I handed it over to the student's mother and she talked a little bit about how her daughter had a stroke in utero and you know what those complications were. And then the special educator and the one-on-one -on -one were there and they talked a little bit more about how this child is learning things but at her own rate. And then we said, are there any questions? Right, and, and we've conditioned kids not to talk about disability, right? We've kind of created this mentality of it's like, shh, don't talk about it. So, right, all the kids are like looking at each other like, wait, we can actually talk about this. We can actually ask questions. So, you know, we had to do a little prompting, like it's okay to ask questions, it's okay to be curious, like we had to warm them up, make them feel comfortable with it. Finally, one student raised their hand and said, well, what does she like to do on the weekends? 
And her mom said, well, she likes to play with her sister, and she likes to watch TV, and she likes to ride her bike. And another student raised their hand and said, well, what TV shows does she like? Well, she likes SpongeBob, and she likes this, and she likes that. Well, well I like SpongeBob, too. Three quarters of the rest of the conversation were this student's classmates making connections to the way that they were the same rather than asking questions about her difference. And it was like a light bulb to me, like if we as adults step outside of our comfort zone and we create safe and respectful environments to facilitate these meaningful conversations about difference, whether it's disability related or other types of differences, Students don't recognize how they're different, but in fact, they start to realize that we're more the same than we are different. So that night, I called up a friend of mine who uh, is a business consultant and has helped start um, businesses and nonprofits. And I said, can I meet you at this local pub and buy you a beer and pick your brain, right? So I met her and we sat down and I said, I have this idea, like I wanna create an entity that helps schools bring disability awareness to their teachers, to their parents, and ultimately to their students. And she was like, great idea. Here's the first form you got to fill out. And so it kind of spiraled from there. So that's a little bit about me and um, my story. But what I'd like to do now is give you an opportunity to introduce yourself to the people sitting at your table. And I want you, some of you probably know each other, some of you don't. But what I'd like you to do, I'll give you about two or three minutes, your name, where you work, and I want you, disability awareness is a very unique subject, so I want you just to think about and then share with the people at your table what brought you here today. What about disability awareness is interesting, engaging, perhaps concerning to you, whatever it is that brought you here today. So I'll give you two or three minutes to do that, and then we'll come back together. All right, so I'm going to ask that we start wrapping up our conversations. Um, so a couple more housekeeping items before we get started. One, we're going to do a lot of kind of small group chatting for short periods of time, and then I'll invite you to look back up front. Um, I sort of apologize interrupting your conversations ahead of time. I say sort of because secretly I love interrupting your conversations because <laughs> it tells me as the facilitator of this group that you have more that you could talk about. And I really hope that this morning's presentation and workshop about disability awareness isn't the end for you, but rather just the beginning. Um, and then it really sparks um, new things for you. The other thing is that we're a small enough group this morning that I'm not going to do an isolated question and answer time at some point, but rather I invite you to interrupt me at any point. As I said, I was an elementary school teacher, well versed in getting interrupted, so please <laughs> do not feel bashful just to you know throw up a hand um, and I'll pause with what I'm talking about and address your question or comment. So um, now that we know each other a little bit better, uh, we're going to kind of jump right in here. So um, I don't want today's presentation to be kind of a sales pitch for Changing Perspectives, but I do want to tell you right off the bat what Changing Perspectives offers to schools. Um, and I am more than happy to follow up with anybody who might be interested in utilizing our programming material in your school. Um, so on the front page of that packet in your green folder is my email address. Um, I think Kathy will attest I am on email pretty much 24 seven. So if you email me, I will get right back to you. Um, I come out to the Bay Area every couple of months. Um, so I'm kind of in and out of this area, always happy to meet with schools, school teams, um, and get things happening in schools. Um, that's our website. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I invite you to like and follow and share us. We try to not just post original content about what we're doing in schools, but we also post a lot of articles. I, we just posted an article yesterday about why empathy is important to teach in schools. We posted an article last week about the importance of disability awareness in schools, especially at the beginning of the school year. So we try to really be a resource for educators like yourselves who are interested in these topics. 
So what does Changing Perspectives offer? Um, we offer schools disability awareness programming through a combination of curriculum materials and teacher training opportunities. We have curriculum from pre-K through high school. All of our curriculum materials are online through our website. So this is not like a second step curriculum or something like that where you're just gonna get a box in the mail and you're gonna open it up and you're gonna do lesson one, unit one. Lesson two, unit one. Lesson three, unit three, right? This is an online platform that you log into and have access to a plethora of resources. It's built for teacher customization. You log in, there are lesson plans, there are book lists, there are literature units, there are disability simulation activities, there are videos with discussion questions, there are role playing activities and art projects and all sorts of stuff on this online portal. And you log in and you pick and choose. You use what's gonna be meaningful for your students. You use what you have time to do in your schools. It's built for educator customization, meaning that you can use it as long as you want, as short as you want. You can set up as many teachers in your school to have access to it, or as few teachers as you want. Built for customization pre-K through high school. Um, we also offer professional development training for educators that comes in a couple packages. Um, we will come and do like a whole staff professional development training. Um, those trainings can be specific to our curriculum if your school chooses to utilize it. But those trainings don't have to be specific to, your, to the curriculum. They could be trainings on um, empathy. They could be trainings on inclusion. We've done trainings on just disability awareness in general. In addition to whole staff professional development training, we also offer small group or one-on-one -on -one coaching with an individual teacher or a small team of teachers. Um, and usually that is if, let's say, the fifth grade team at your school is using our curriculum, you can also get coaching hours. So we can be available to support those fifth grade teachers to make sure the way in which they're utilizing the curriculum is going to have the greatest impact for all students and work within the constraints of their class schedule. So that's what we do in a nutshell. Um, and like I said, if it's something that you're interested in learning more about or talking about fees associated or, or how to get started, um, you know, I'm happy to chat with you at the break today or after or shoot me an email. We can schedule a time uh, to connect. Before I go any further, any questions so far? Well, I do want to point out that we have Savitha in the audience who's actually used it. Yes. So raise your hand. You're now a resource. Woo! OK. <laughs> Sorry, I had to call you out. <laughs> the motto of Changing Perspectives is promoting awareness, inspiring empathy. And this um, image is in your packet, too, if you want to take notes on it. Empathy, as we all know, is a pretty big buzzword in schools these days, right? Everybody's talking about empathy, 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 empathy. We have to teach empathy. You walk through schools, they have posters, empathy, put yourself in someone else's shoes, all of this talk about empathy. But we very often, or we, we rarely really unpack empathy and really think about, okay, what is empathy? How do I teach them to my students? So empathy is the ability to understand someone else's perspective in a given situation. And as educators, when things arise in school, we tend to say things to students like, well, be empathetic, right? I believe that students cannot be empathetic. Students cannot demonstrate empathy unless they first have a solid foundation of an awareness of other people and their perspectives. So I use this house to illustrate that. So when you build a house, you pour your foundation first, and that's what supports everything else. If we want students to have a solid roof of empathy, we need to first provide them with a solid foundation, a deep foundation of awareness of differences. And that starts with talking about differences in the classroom. Again, whether those differences are disability, race, gender identification, socioeconomic, whatever it might be. 
if we could provide students from a young age with a solid foundation of awareness of differences, as they work up the stories of the house or as they work through the chapters of their life and they move out beyond the community in which they live in and they start perhaps interacting with people from different past experiences and different perspectives, they'll have that foundation to fall back on so they can demonstrate it with that roof of empathy, with that ability to fully understand someone else's perspective in a given situation, right? For example, I can't expect you right now to have empathy towards my situation growing up with a facial difference and wearing a hearing aid if I first don't provide you with some context or some awareness or some information about what it was like for me to grow up with a facial difference in hearing loss. So I know that's kind of a long-winded explanation, but I think it's really important that we think about how if we want students to be empathetic to their classmates, they need to have an awareness of their classmates and their differences. And they don't just, intrins they don't just uh, naturally learn it, right? We have to facilitate those conversations and those activities with students. So um, what I want to do next is show you one of my favorite TED Talks. And it's a TED Talk called We Are All Different and That's Awesome. And I like this TED Talk for a variety of reasons. One, because it's done by a kid, not an adult. So I think he's 10, 11, 12 years old. And two, he talks about a friendship of his that's pretty special. And as you watch it, I don't want to give too much away right now, but as you watch it, I want you to be thinking about one or two things. One, why you think I chose this video to link to our conversation today about disability awareness. And then I also want you to put on your working with students hat and think about what amazing conversations you might be able to facilitate with a group of students if a group of students watch this video. minutes, I'm going to teach you that it's okay to be different. Since a young age, I've worn different colored socks and two different shoes. Why? Because I am unique. A standout from the crowd. I feel best when I am being me. This summer, a funny thing happened. I was in a bookstore with my mom when I realized everyone was strangely quiet. And so I did what needed to be done. I started singing. As a joke, my mom pointed to a book and said, Hey Cole, this book is for you. I pulled it out and read the cover. Here's what it said. You're weird. <laughs> a creative journal for misfits, oddballs, and anyone else who's uniquely awesome. It's the best book ever. It tells everyone it's cool to be different. Today I'm going to tell you about a friendship of mine that is a little different than you might expect. This is one of my best friends, Stephen. He is the happiest person I know. Stephen is 44 years old and has autism. Let me start by explaining how we became special friends. When my mom was just 13 years old, she was in the high school cafeteria about to have lunch with her friends. Then she passed a table of kids with special needs. Stephen was a boy at that table. He shouted out, Hey, what's your name? Come sit with me. My mom sat down, and in that moment, a special friendship began. Stephen asked my mom three questions. He wanted to know what she was having for lunch, her phone number, and if they could be friends for 40 years. <laughs> As my mom gave him her phone number and said yes, he clapped with excitement and said, I will call you every day. <laughs> Ever since that day, in 1988, he has kept his promise and called our house every single day. When I was born, Stephen was a special part of our family, and I've grown up calling him Uncle Stephen. Stephen is included in family dinners, he comes to my soccer games, he loves watching movies with us, and every couple of weeks he has a sleepover. Stephen has had autism his whole life. 
Autism Spectrum Disorder refers to a range of conditions characterized by challenges with social skills, repetitive behaviors, speech, and nonverbal communications, as well as by unique strengths and differences. My friend Stephen is not able to drive a car, but he is able to memorize every phone number he has ever heard. <laughs> there is no cure for autism, but I think Stephen is perfect the way he is. One of my favorite memories with Stephen is whenever a fire truck passes us. He shouts out, when I grew up, I want to be a fire truck. <laughs> that always makes me smile. He likes the idea of being a fireman, but he loves the idea of being a fire truck. <laughs> Another thing that always makes me laugh is how much he likes to eat. Have you ever met someone who can eat a steak, a slice of pizza, french fries, apple pie, ice cream, and they are still starving? <laughs> well, Stephen eats all that almost every time we see him. Finally, one of my favorite memories with Stephen is when we play hide and seek. He always hides in the closets. <laughs> I love playing hide and seek with Stephen. It always makes me smile. But not just me. He makes everyone smile. I don't think we need a cure for autism, just like we don't need a cure for freckles. Autism is not a disease, just like brown hair isn't a disease. You don't need to fix something that isn't broken. I look up to my Uncle Stephen as he is the happiest person I know. Stephen doesn't try to be like anyone else. He is exactly who he was meant to be. Imagine a world where we all live like Stephen. Find out what makes you different. Don't be afraid to stand out. Wake up, jump out of bed, and be exactly who you are. We are all a little different, and that's awesome. Thank you. <laughs>so I'll give you uh, just a minute or so for table groups just to discuss those two questions I posed with you earlier, which is one, how does this video relate to what we're talking about today around disability awareness in schools? And two, what conversations do you think you might be able to have or facilitate with students that you work with um, in schools if you use this video as a prompt? So what I'd like to do now I had a chance to listen in on a few conversations. It seems like that video brought up a lot for people in terms of ideas and past experiences and all of that. Um, I invite you too, as I share this information, to take notes of these resources. Because if you start going and watching this video, right, like YouTube will say, other videos you might like. And you can go through like what I call like the 2 AM rabbit hole on <laughs> Pinterest or YouTube, where you start finding stuff. Um, is there anybody who wants to share something out to the large group, something that you talked about at your table group that you think other people in the room would benefit from hearing? An idea, a thought, anything? Yeah, go for it. Exactly, that's a great point. And part of what we're going to do kind of the second half of this morning is really unpack how do we implement disability awareness programming in the most effective way. And one thing that we want to move away from is what I call like a one and done, like a one day disability awareness event or schools will bring in a speaker to talk at the kids for an hour, right? We want to move away from that. We want disability awareness to be something that's seamlessly integrated 
every day into the school culture and into the school climate. And that, that takes empowering classroom teachers or teachers that are there all the time. There's a couple disability awareness um, programs that I know of in the country where parent volunteers go into the school and lead a workshop. Now that's all great, but that's a one and done. That's someone that comes in for an hour and leaves and the kids may or may not ever see that person again, right? So it's how do we help school culture, school climates and educators change their thinking so they don't think about this as another initiative on top of everything else, but really an approach that we're going to integrate into what we're already doing every day. The other piece that you just spoke about, um, I was gonna save it for later, but we'll just jump into it right now, because why not, is when we talk about disability, that can be what I call a high-risk conversation for some people, right? Disability, different people have different experiences with disability, and it can be personal, and it can ignite vulnerabilities. And so before we get to that high-risk conversation, we want to condition our students in our classroom on how do we talk about difference as a whole, or we start with low risk conversation. And I would even push you to go even lower risk. So before you even talk about knowing someone with a difference, having kids share their favorite colors, their favorite ice cream flavors, right? Moving from, I call it the risk ladder, moving from low risk conversation to high risk conversation. So I'll give you some examples. You might start on the first day by having students turn and talk to a partner about their favorite color. That's very low risk conversation. You're turning and you're talking to one person and you're sharing your favorite color. Would everybody in this room feel comfortable doing that right now? Most likely, yes, that's pretty low risk. The next day, you might have kids in the circle and have them do what I call a whip share where they need to share out amongst the whole circle. And you might have them share their favorite breakfast food. It's a little higher risk because they're sharing out in front of everybody. The next day, you might have them share out with the class how many brothers or sisters they have. That's a little higher risk because you have families, blended families, step-siblings, half-siblings, foster siblings. They might be in the foster system themselves, and they're not really sure who they count as a brother or sister siblings that don't live with them anymore, siblings that have passed away. And so it gets back to this whole idea of implementing disability awareness in a really intentional and scaffolded way. We need to teach disability awareness the same way we teach math. There's a reason we teach addition before subtraction. There's a reason we teach multiplication before division, right? We have to think about it in the same way if we want the outcomes to be as greatest as possible. So really going back to the very kind of um, um, basics and thinking about, okay, if I want to talk about autism because I have a student in my class with autism, how am I going to scaffold that conversation? How am I going to build towards that high risk conversation because it's about a disability, it's about an invisible disability, and it's about a disability that's prevalent in this classroom, which is like the highest risk you can get when it comes to disability awareness. How do I scaffold that? How do I help students develop the skills? How do I, as a teacher, develop my own professional skills to facilitate conversations when we talk about difference? And let's start with low risk and move to high risk. Is that helpful? Yes. Great. Um, any other thoughts or questions? And we'll be talking a lot more about that the later part when we kind of have our workshop style to plan out how we might use this in our schools. All right. So um, what is disability awareness? Um, a good place to start um, this morning. Disability awareness is not disability advocacy. And I emphasize that because sometimes people think the two are the same, and they're not. Disability awareness is not advocating for equal rights or equal opportunities for students for disabilities. That's separate. Disability advocacy may occur after awareness. But disability awareness is simply that. It's building awareness. It's building that foundation to that house model about disability for all students. Educating all students with disabilities. Um, I don't know your name. Jeannie. What is it? Jeannie. Jeannie? Yeah. 
Um, so Jeannie earlier um, asked me the story I shared earlier about having my students learn about their classmate with a disability. Jeannie asked me, was that classmate there? And the answer is yes. Disability awareness is educating all students with and without disabilities with students with disabilities in the room. And sometimes I run into schools where they're like, oh, well, we did disability awareness because we talked to the kids with disabilities about their disabilities. Or they say to me, well, we did disability awareness because we talked to the kids without disabilities about the kids in the other room with disabilities. Okay, neither of that in my mind is disability awareness. Disability awareness is everybody in the room learning, connecting, and sharing together. When we do that, when we create those safe and respectful environments to share, what do we find? Well, we find that students are making connections with other students in new ways. We find that the teacher is making connections with students in new ways. So it's a win-win for students and teachers. But that only happens if everyone is there together. And like I said earlier, when we break down these barriers, when we push ourselves as, as adults to talk about things, and just like I was saying earlier, that kids are conditioned to not talk about these things. We were all kids once. We've all been conditioned to really not talk about it, right? Um, you know, if you're a parent, odds are you've been in an environment with your child where they see someone with a difference and your child starts pointing or whispering and asking you questions. Uh, what do we do? We grab our kid, we say, don't talk about it, don't point, and we leave the environment, right? I'm sure most of us are guilty of that at one point or another. And then how many parents out there or how many people out there do you think get in the car and say, now let's talk about it, right? Most people don't. So when we talk about it, we start to break down the barriers around difference. We start to model for our students that it is okay to have these conversations. Kids are naturally curious. Oftentimes, the questions that they ask, sometimes from our perspective, comes off as rude or inappropriate or not politically correct. But that's not what they mean, right? They're just naturally inquisitive. They're naturally curious. And they just, what's wrong with that guy? Why is that guy so weird, you know? Um, but we, we kind of have to accept that as they're just curious. So we have to engage. We have to have those conversations. Questions, concerns? Just want to check the pulse of the room. So why now? Why is disability awareness more important now in 2019 than ever before? Well, there's a couple reasons. One, empathy is being known as one of the most important 21st century schools, or 21st century skills for students. Um, have people read the, uh, the report that came out by the Aspen Institute about social emotional learning? Nation at Hope. Raise your hand if you're familiar with that. OK, everybody should be familiar with that. So the Aspen Institute um, just put out this huge uh, report about the impact of social emotional learning. And it's the first time that a big report has been brought out. And I believe it's, it's either nationathope.org or nationofhope.org. Um, if you're interested in empathy education, social emotional learning, you've got to read this report, especially if you're going back to your school and you're trying to make a sell to your administrator who might be more data driven. Um, there's a lot of data in that report um, about the importance of social emotional learning and empathy education now more than ever before. Um, but one of the reasons I would argue that empathy education or empathy is more important now than ever before is that as students graduate school, and head out into the workforce today, they don't need to be book smart. They don't have to memorize things like they needed to 10 or 20 years ago, right? Because anything that they need to know how to do, they can look up, right? We all do it. I was at home last week between when I was in Washington and coming here, and I was trying to put um, figure out how to put more um, I don't even know what it's called, but the little rope at the end of the weed whacker 
because I was doing some yard work and I couldn't figure out how to do it. So I just YouTube like how to add more rope at the end of this model, right? And I figured out how to do it. So kids can figure out how to do anything because they have YouTube and Google. What skills do they need to be competitive and successful in the 21st century global marketplace? They need to collaborate, they need to communicate, and they need to network. They're collaborating, communicating, and networking, not necessarily with the person that lives next door to them who has the same perspective on things or the same past experiences, but they're collaborating, communicating, and networking with people all across the globe in this global marketplace that we live in. And all three of those skills boil down to one, which is empathy. Um, we know that most instances of intolerance at school or instances of bullying, I put those in quotes because I think it's totally overused in education and most people don't know the legal definition of it, um, but most instances of bullying or intolerance are a result of ignorance. Students not understanding someone else, which makes that someone else an easy target. So if we want to eradicate or reduce the amount of bullying or intolerance between students, we need to get rid of the ignorance. We need to help students better understand their classmates. And we know now that our school communities are becoming more and more diverse, and that the diversity isn't just physical anymore, but it's invisible. You know, kids struggling with gender identification that might be invisible, um, emotional and behavioral disturbance, kids who've experienced trauma, um, anxiety, all of those mental health challenges or invisible disabilities, right? That's diversity, and it's only increasing in our schools and in our school systems. So those, I believe, are the three main reasons why this work is so important. And I understand that you're all here for a reason, so I may be preaching to the choir because you've chosen to participate in this workshop. Um, but hopefully that helps to solidify or put some new language to why this work is important. Just one thing is here that, you know, I really see the reason. And then one of our goal is to explain the caring of the children without the disability why we like to offer the inclusive program so that it will benefit your children as well too. And one of the, and sometimes I kind of, you know, switch empathy with multiple perspectives when we talk about the 21st century skills. But one of the example is my son is a Silicon Valley engineer, he's adult. But as a being a young man, sometimes he gets frustrated. Other people do not get that first that they do older people, somebody who are different. And then one day he applied for the manager position. And then they, the company told him, well, you are not ready for the leadership position because you easily get frustrated when other people are different from you. So that's kind of like a buy-in to convince other parents. Yes, my inclusion is important. Right, and I think that parent education piece is really important. We worked with the school, um, down in the Los Angeles area that implemented our curriculum materials. And one of the things that they wanted to do was um, do some parent programming as well. So I helped them um, organize and then facilitate this parent evening program. Uh, it was really powerful. And what made it powerful is that, you know, I was up there and I did my spiel about this and helped to facilitate. But then within the school community, um, we found parents of students with disabilities who wanted to get up in front of the other parents and share their stories and help gain that multiple perspectives, help the other parents understand why the parent with the, the, parent with the child with the disability felt so strongly about this. It was a really powerful um, evening for everybody involved. Um, and I like that idea of multiple perspectives because that's really um, ultimately what it is. Anybody else have any thoughts, comments that they'd like to share at this point? So that actually is such a perfect segue because the next thing I want to do is show you this um, little video clip um, to get us thinking about the idea of perspective taking. I also want you to show, I will also want to show you this video clip to get us thinking about how our schools and our societies 
are generally designed for one type of person or one type of student. And how if you're not that person, if you're not that type of person, how challenging things can be, right? Um, so this is a very short 30 second video clip. It shows what the world would be like if the world was designed for people with disabilities and people without disabilities were the minority. Okay, I'm gonna say that one more time. This is a video clip that shows what the world would be like if it was designed for people with disabilities and people without disabilities were the minority. And as you watch it, I want you to notice all of the things that are all of the daily tasks that are more challenging for the people without disabilities. Just shout them out that you noticed were hard for the people without disabilities in this video. Reading. 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 So they went to the library, they opened up the book. What was in the book? Braille. Braille. What else? Opening the bank account. <laughs> opening the bank account. She goes up, she's trying to open a bank account. The, tel the teller only used sign language outside on the sidewalk trying to ask someone for directions um, and they're going by um, in their wheelchairs. What other things did you notice? Trying to walk down the ramp and kind of sliding down. All right, I'm gonna show it to you one more time. See if you can notice something else. Hello, I'd like to open a bank account. Well, it is the loneliest number that you'll ever do. Two can be as bad as one. It's the only number since the number one. Access for everyone. What was something you noticed the second time that you didn't notice the first time? Yeah, so kind of the whole experience is not as clean or concise that it might be. Right. Now, obviously, this video is a little outdated because we don't really have pay phones anymore. But yeah, they go to the payphone and they've got to um, bend down. Did you notice the walk signals? And did you notice the, I think it's a little boy and his mom, and the boy is pointing at the person that's walking? So I love that video. Um, you can find it just by going to YouTube and typing in disability awareness, it pops right up. Cool thing again to show to students. Um, I've worked with some schools where the students have done a couple things from watching this video. One, they've kind of done an assessment of their school and how accessible their school really is. 
and or two students kind of creating their own version of a video like this as a PSA announcement for their school. So there's lots of cool things you could do, but ultimately I like showing this video because it helps put us in check about perspective taking, right? And thinking about our school and thinking about our students and recognizing that generally schools are designed for one type of student and for students who don't fit that mold, how challenging everything can be throughout the day from talking on the phone to opening a banking account to crossing the street, all these daily things that we do really without thinking. Let's go back to this. Um, in your packet, on the maybe first page, there should be a box that says the word differences under the model of the empathy awareness house. What I'd like you to do as we think about inclusion, as we think about disability awareness, I want you to think about the differences in the student population that you work with. So if you work in one classroom or one school, you can think about that. If you work in a line of sites, maybe just pick one site in your mind. And what I'm going to do um, is I'm going to throw some differences up here on the board. And these are just six to get us thinking. What I'd like to do is give you about one minute of silent no talking, where I want you in that box that says differences to jot down, it could be ideas from the board, other ideas, what differences, what diversity makes up the student population that you work with. So take about a minute to do that without talking, and then I'll tell you the next step. So that was about a minute. Now what I'm going to do is give you a couple minutes to share with the people your table groups, share what you wrote, compare, contrast, add things to your list. I want you to think about difference in the broadest way possible. I'm going to give you just one other example. Um, I did this activity um, with a group of high school educators. Um, and one of the differences that one of the educators wrote down that I never thought of before that I thought was so interesting was the clothes students were wearing and how the clothes that they were wearing led to other areas of difference, right? So kids who had, you know, brand new, nice, fancy clothes, and then kids who had shoes that were too big for them because they were hand-me-downs or, or given, you know, through a charity of sort. So compare and contrast with your group the differences that you see and make any other notes um, in that box. Anybody have something they want to share out with the whole group? Going through this exercise, reflecting on differences, sharing, comparing, contrasting with others. Has there been kind of a light bulb or an aha moment or something that you never thought of before that you think everyone in the room would benefit from hearing? So the question is, was there something that this sparked for you? Was there a light bulb moment or something that you didn't think of before that you think um, everyone in the room would benefit from hearing from that you want to share out? Yeah. Um, so the program that uh, I work for the County Office of Education and the Office of Health and Welfare, and I go to different classrooms, and all, almost all the classrooms I go to have to be in order to see the disability. So um, in the classroom, it just is students. The variety that we see in their abilities, their levels of functioning is so huge. And it's very difficult to find um, group lessons or things that we can do for everyone that's meaningful and interesting to all our students. Um, but one of those, in, in that process, it's also important to teach students who don't find the lesson things at home or who cannot understand what's going on in the class to sit and wait to be able to tolerate this unfair system. <laughs> So um, I just came to my mind that in order for us to be able to appreciate differences, it's also important to um, tolerate, build more tolerance. You know, I don't know if we can relate to this, but just it's, it's more even to make our students um, further see.
proceed without majority of the no more, no more than just twenty percent disability um, students without disabilities or general education population to be able to come to campus and interact with students without those disabilities to be able to you have to teach our students with disabilities to be able to learn some self regulation skills to be able to be more approachable or be more um, so just just looking at it from both ways that was what came to my mind when we were having this great. Thanks. When I think it's something that it's an exercise, it's such a simple exercise, but we often mm -hmm. very rarely do it. Like we never really sit down. Like all right, let's really think about all of the differences that we're dealing with um, in our schools and in our school systems. Um, so I think it's just you know when we start talking more specifically about building programs and integrating disability awareness into our school and teaching empathy and creating more authentically inclusive learning environments. We have to first buy, first think about and really write down, okay, well, what are the differences that I'm working with? And every school has their own climate, their own culture, and serves kind of a unique population of students. So each of our sites um, is going to vary in terms of the diversity of the student body. Um, so here's what I'd like to do. It is, wow, almost 11 o'clock. Um, I want to go over, um, I think, one more slide and then take a few minutes uh, for a break for people to get up, stretch, use the restroom, refill water bottles, um, and then we'll come back uh, together for the remainder of our time. So um, before we go on break, um, I just want to talk a little bit about the word disability in 2019 and that we have visible disabilities and invisible disabilities. So one of the reasons why I think that disability awareness is the best kind of launching pad to talk about all differences is that disability, disability is really the largest minority in the world. And it's the only minority in the world that crosses all races, all genders, all socioeconomic groups, all ethnicities that there's visible disabilities and invisible disabilities. And it's the only minority that anyone could become a part of at any moment of any day. You're in a car accident, you have a stroke, you have a child with a disability, you're now a part of that community. So I think disability is so universal. Everyone in this room has some connection themselves or with a loved one or a friend who functions within the world of disability in one way or another. Now within disability, we have visible disabilities and invisible disabilities. And when I use the term disability under the umbrella of disability awareness, I think about it with all categories from IDEA. So we're talking everything from a very kind of physical, obvious disability, like maybe a student with cerebral palsy, all the way to students with learning disabilities, trauma, um, anxiety, mental health challenges, speech impairments, right? Like we're really looking at it from a very broad perspective. So a couple things that I wanted to break down about visible disabilities and invisible disabilities. Visible disabilities tend to be the easiest for students to empathize with. They're concrete, they're obvious. Students can understand how something might be challenging in gym class for their classmate who uses a wheelchair, right? Like that's very concrete and very tangible for students to wrap their heads around. It's very defined, right? Like they can, they can point it out. But one of the other things about visible disabilities that we need to be aware of when we start engaging with students around disability awareness is that visible disabilities tend to be more prone to stereotypes or bias. Has anyone read the book, um, Out of My Mind? All right, you should read the book, Out of My Mind. Um, I forget the author, but it has, if you go to Amazon, it has a goldfish jumping out of a bowl. Um, out of the, My Mind kind of fits under the same genre as the book Wonder. It's a fictional story about a middle school age girl who has cerebral palsy um, and is nonverbal, but she makes her school's quiz bowl team. And the whole story is told through her perspective or her eyes. It's a great book to read. I would say third grade, third and fourth grade be a little young. I would say fifth grade and up. Um, a great book to read with. And what I like about it is that 
it's that reminder for students and for ourselves that just because someone has a physical disability doesn't mean they have a cognitive inability. Even though this character cannot walk and cannot talk using her mouth, she's still incredibly smart and takes her school's quiz bowl team to like the championship. So one thing to remind ourselves when we engage with students around um, disability awareness, around those visible disabilities. Those invisible disabilities, though, however, are growing in number. In our Changing Perspectives curriculum, we have our curriculum resources divided out by what we call category of disability. And we have three categories that I would say fit under invisible disabilities. Social emotional disabilities, autism spectrum, and learning disabilities. And when I go to a school and I show the educators what categories of disability our curriculum fits under, and I ask them which ones they're interested in using with their students, nine out of 10 times teachers go to those. But if we think about that risk ladder, if we think about intentionality and scaffolding, and we know that students have a harder time empathizing with the invisible disabilities, then we need to start with the visible disabilities. We need to start with things that students can empathize and, and um, um, concretely understand first. But those invisible disabilities are growing by number, but they're much more abstract, right? Like I remember when I taught my students could empathize with their classmate who had a physical challenge. But they had a really hard time empathizing with this one student I had one year who had emotional and behavioral disturbance and would mean that we would have to evacuate our classroom once or twice a week because this student wasn't safe, right? And all the other students were like, oh, why does he always throw books or why does he always do that, right? They couldn't empathize with it. It was very abstract. So we need to recognize that. Um, and so as a result, it tends to be harder for students to empathize with. So with that being said, um, it is about 10 minutes to 11. Um, so I think what we should do is take a break, come back at 11. What we're going to do is run through the difference between empathy and sympathy for about 30 minutes or so. Then I'm going to give you some case studies of some ways disability awareness has worked in schools for about 30 minutes. And then I'm going to leave the last 30 minutes as a total kind of workshop time for you to work on filling in that chart, um, sharing ideas, um, asking me for ideas. Um, and hopefully when you leave at 1230, you'll have some kind of action steps for things you can take back to your school or your sites to start implementing some disability awareness. Um, so take the next 10 minutes, go to the bathroom, stretch your legs, fill up water bottles, do what you need to do. So um, what we're going to do, as I said right before the break, is we're going to do three things in our remaining hour and a half here together. Um, we're going to unpack the difference between empathy and sympathy. Because I believe that if we're going to be leaders of empathy education, and leaders of disability awareness in our schools and in our school sites, we need to kind of have a really solid understanding of what is empathy and do a little like self-reflection, right? We can't expect ourselves to teach empathy to our students if we haven't first reflected on how empathetic really we are. Um, so we're going to kind of unpack empathy versus sympathy and talk a little bit about that. Um, then I want to go through some case studies of ways other schools have implemented disability awareness, throw out a lot more resources uh, for you. I know I've shared some books and I've shared some videos at this point, but I want to share some more um, and then give you some time to really start mapping out and thinking about you know, how you might utilize this in your schools or your school sites, who might be the champions in your schools that you might go to, like really get, like I want to get down to that nitty gritty, like you know, who might be the people I can go to to get on board, what are going to be the barriers, what supports am I going to need, all of that stuff. So let's start with empathy versus sympathy. In your packet, there is a box I believe that says empathy, Is there? Yes? Yes. I'm going to give you 30 seconds independently by yourself without talking with your neighbor. I would like you to write down right now what currently is your personal definition of empathy. So empathy is dot, dot, dot. 
You can tell I was an elementary educator because I'm making you all do like a pre-assessment right now. So guess what we're going to do in about 25 minutes? You're going to write down your a new definition, perhaps, of empathy. All right, so just hold that on your paper right now. I really like putting this picture of eyes up here on the board because as we've been talking a lot this morning, empathy is about understanding multiple perspectives in a given situation. And I like this visual of the eyes because I think it's just something that you can kind of take like a mental photograph of. And when you think about empathy or when you're talking to colleagues about empathy or a student about empathy, hopefully this picture of the eyes will just pop into your head as just a visual reminder about the importance of perspective taking. And that when we're in a situation where we're trying to perhaps de-escalate a student or help facilitate a conflict between one student and another, being able to take yourself out of the situation or kind of pause any emotion that you might be feeling and just think about this picture and think about the situation from each student's perspective and what are they coming from? What is their home life like? What happened five minutes before the event that you're trying to help facilitate? And that perspective taking is such a key and it's so hard. And I think oftentimes when people think of empathy and what we tell our students is put yourself in someone else's shoes. And that's like sort of true. But empathy isn't about having to have had the exact same experience as someone else. Empathy is about relating to someone else. So if someone is feeling angry because of a situation, to be empathetic, I don't have to have had, had the same experience happen to me. I need to have had an experience happen to me that also made me feel angry. Right? I'm trying to connect with that person. I'm trying to connect to their perspective. And that's driven by that emotional experience. What I'm going to do now is show you, um, you could tell I like videos. Um, it is the last video of the morning, I promise. Um, this is Brene Brown's um, video. I'm sure some of you have seen it. It kind of goes through cycles where it goes viral on Facebook. Um, but it's Brene Brown um, narrating with kind of an animated illustration the difference between empathy and sympathy. And there's a couple things that I want us to pay attention to in this video. One, the way in which Brene Brown describes how empathy drives connection between human beings and how sympathy drives disconnection between human beings. And this relates to disability awareness because oftentimes you'll see like, um, or, or kids respond to a classmate with a disability in a sympathetic way, right? Like, oh, well, let's, let's help him, right? That's sympathetic opposed to empathetic. And you see those videos that go online too, right? Or go viral of like the kids helping the other kid th to the finish line of a race or whatever. And that's all like good and it feels good, but to really challenge ourselves, like is that sympathetic or is that empathetic? And that empathy is what drives connection. And so empathy is what's gonna move us forward, not sympathy. In addition to that, she also unpacks empathy into four pillars. And there's a chart in your handout that has the four pillars or the four components of empathy. So don't feel like you need to um, write them down. But what I did put together in this chart is some headings, so some things to think about for yourself related to each of the four components of empathy. So as you watch this video, be thinking about how empathy is gonna drive students to build connections with each other when we embed disability awareness in our curriculum. And for those of you who might want to use this as a resource, it could be a great thing to show your faculty at a staff meeting time. Um, if you just go to YouTube and type in empathy versus sympathy, it's usually the first thing that pops up. So what is empathy? And why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's a, it, very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar. 
who studied professions, very diverse professions where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. <laughs> Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, and climb down. I know what it's like down here. And you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, <laughs> it's bad, uh-huh. <laughs> uh, no, you want a sandwich? <laughs> um, Empathy is a choice, and it's a vulnerable choice, because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. <laughs> I had it, yeah. And we do it all the time, because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful, and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put this little lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. I love that video, and I've seen it a whole bunch of times, and every time I see it and I listen to her unpack empathy versus sympathy, I hear something else. There's like another light bulb that goes off for me. So empathy. Brene Brown breaks down empathy into these four components. Perspective taking, the eyes that I showed you a minute ago, being able, and it's hard, it's really hard, but being able to take the perspective of someone else, staying out of judgment, recognizing connections, so figuring out a way to make a connection with someone else. And it goes back to the story I shared with you at the very beginning of this morning of my student um, with apraxia in the circle, and that the classmates started to make those connections, started to figure out there are more ways that we're the same than we are different and then communication. Now, if I was better at graphic design, I would have not done these in a bulleted list and I would have somehow done it in a web. Because really, it's the way in which we communicate with others. And this is what we want our students to be able to do. It's the way in which we communicate with others that we're sharing with them, I'm making a connection with you. I'm staying out of judgment of you. I'm not judging your situation. I, I'm not forcing my bias or my stereotypes and I'm taking your perspective. So here's what I'd like to do. I'd like us to um, chat a little bit about this. Um, and there are those, those columns on that chart if you want to take any notes on your paper. But what I'd like you to do is give you five minutes probably with the people at your table. I want us to do a little self-reflection because if we want to share this information with our colleagues or if we want to help inspire empathy amongst our students, we need to reflect on ourselves a little bit. So of those four pillars, which one is hardest for you as an individual? Of those four pillars, have you had success in one area? Is there a personal or a professional story that you could share with the people at your table about a time that you really took someone's perspective? a time where you stayed out of judgment even though maybe you were interacting with someone who was very different than you, a time that you built a connection with someone and you didn't think you were going to. Is there a quick little anecdotal story that you could share? 
And then um, from that story, which one of these of four components would you say is your greatest strength? So about five minutes, that's going to be pretty quick to go through these three questions. So you might want to just kind of go around the table and just have everyone share you know, their strength, the one that's hard, and then their story. And then we'll come back together as a whole group. All right, I'm going to ask that we start wrapping up these conversations and coming back together. So it's great to walk around and kind of eavesdrop on your conversations. It sounds like there's a lot of rich conversations. And as I was walking around, I heard such a variety of, of sharing, of people sharing personal situations, professional situations. Um, it's really great because it goes back to you know what we're doing right now is disability awareness. We've watched videos. We've had discussions. We're sharing. We're all here together. We're, we're making those connections amongst each other. I want to do a quick, silent survey. And before we do it, I want to establish that we are all empathetic beings in here. We are all staying out of judgment. We are all respectful. So what I'd like to do is do a little um, room uh, survey of which one of these components of empathy are hardest and or easiest for us. So we'll start with low risk because we're going to do that risk ladder. It's always easier to share what we're good at than our challenges. So let's start with low risk. So I'd like you to silently raise your hand if you said, if you said perspective taking was your greatest strength out of these four. All right. Hands down. Raise your hand if you said staying out of judgment was your greatest strength. Right. Hands down. What if you said recognizing connections was your greatest strength? And what if you said communication was your greatest strength? All right, thanks, hands down. Now we'll do the ones that are a little more challenging for us. So if you said perspective taking was hardest for you, raise your hand. Thanks. If you said staying out of judgment was hardest for you, raise your hand. Thanks, hands down. If you said recognizing connections, was hardest for you? Raise your hand. And if you said communication was challenging for you, raise your hand. All right, thanks. So we have kind of a nice diversity in our room of where people feel their strengths are and where their challenges are related to this. So when we think about empathy and we think about connection, whether that's for ourselves personally or whether that's developing our students to have those skills. We know that building strong relationships with students is essential, right? That's kind of universal in education, that if we as adults can build strong relationships with students, that they'll perform better in school. And we also know that if we as adults can facilitate students building strong relationships to one another, that that could be really powerful. And that's where disability awareness comes into play. When we have a better relationship with students, when we really sit down and write down about all the differences that our students have, when there a conflict arises, we're able to better understand their perspective. Um, right? Like you're outside at recess, and two kids are arguing about whose ball it is or whatever. If you already have a relationship with those students, if you already know their backgrounds, their home lives, what they're coming to, what their perspective is that they're coming to this conflict with, we'll be able to facilitate and help students um, solve those problems with much greater ease. And all humans are social beings. We, dr we drive on interpersonal connections. We all want a sense of belonging. And that's what disability awareness is all about making all students feel like they have a sense of belonging in the school community, regardless of ability and or disability. We're going to skip over that one for purposes of time. So I put together this kind of wordle to get us thinking about 
disability and empathy and inclusion and understanding. Um, so you'll notice that there are some words that stand out more than others. Um, but I just wanted to put this up on the board um, while I take another kind of pulse of the room and see if anybody has any thoughts, questions, aha moments, concerns about what we just discussed related to empathy versus sympathy. Anybody have anything that they want to share aloud? All right. So now what we're going to do is kind of transition from that conversation, moving back to disability awareness. And I understand that that was quick. And I've done three hour workshops with educators just on empathy versus sympathy. So I know that we didn't quite get to the end of all of that, but hopefully it was enough of an introduction so you can start to think about that for yourself, think about that for your schools, and then start to think about how that might correlate to this idea of disability awareness. So um, what I want to do is talk a little bit more, because um, I remember when I was a teacher and I would come to trainings like this or professional development workshops, I wanted to leave with like a tool. Like, I want to leave this room and have something I can do in my classroom. So I want to reserve our last hour or so together to give you those tools, give you resources, give you things to think about so you really feel like you have something that you can start implementing um, or, or planning to implement at some point in the future. So I've mentioned before that disability awareness is really something that should be seamlessly integrated, right? We're all well aware of what I call initiative fatigue in the public education system, right? Every year you come back together and someone stands up at the front of the room and says, this year, this is our new initiative. And everybody in the audience is like, well, what about the last 12 years of initiatives? Those out the window, no, no, you're doing those and now you're doing this too. Disability awareness is seamlessly integrating these concepts into what you're doing every day in your school and your school systems. This is not one more thing. This is something that we're integrating into what we're already doing. And I think that's really, really important to remind ourselves of. The other thing that I wanted to, to say before we jump into this is that the goal, the ultimate goal, or at least from my perspective, the ultimate goal of disability awareness is we want students to become the agents of change for inclusivity in their schools and their communities. Right? We want the students to be taking action. The adults are all seem to be there to always facilitate, but what happens when the adults aren't there? Recess, cafeteria, um, in the neighborhood on the weekend. Right? We want the students to have the skills to be leaders and to become those agents of change to bring about greater inclusion in their schools and their communities. In order to change student behavior, we need to first change attitudes and or perceptions. In order to change attitudes and or perceptions, we need to make sure that all students have that foundational awareness, that understanding about the topic at hand, in this case, disability. So we need to first educate students, build an awareness about disabilities. Then we need to help students take that new knowledge and help push perhaps their preconceived notions, their stereotypes or their biases about disability. And then we could start asking students how that's going to correlate to a change in behavior. And I think it's really important to understand that because oftentimes schools are like, well, we had that speaker come in for an hour, and the kids are still doing x, y, or z. Or we did, you know, we did, we read a book about disabilities, but they're still not including that classmate, right? Like this is a longitudinal process. We're doing this in an intentional and a scaffolded way. We need to start here before we can get here. You might take your first year at your school doing disability awareness, just building awareness and understanding. The second year, you might force change in perception and attitudes. And then the third year, students are able to actually change their actions and their behavior. So it's really important that we think about that, that this isn't a switch. We're not going to do one thing and it's going to be a magic solution, that it's something that's going to take time to change. Thoughts, questions, comments, concerns about that? I concur. Great. <laughs> so how do we do it? Seamless integration. 
So there's lots of ways to integrate disability awareness. As I mentioned before, Changing Perspectives is one organization. Now we have disability awareness curriculum that you can have access to if you're interested. Let me know, I'm happy to um, work with you on that. Um, there are other organizations too, other resources out there to find curriculum material. So for example, understood.org, people familiar with that? Some, okay. So understood.org, tons of resources on their website specific to learning disabilities and executive functioning, but they have some great um, disability simulation activities so kids can go on and like play these little games. They have these great videos of uh, kids with learning disabilities sharing their stories. So there's some great resources there. Um, there are a variety of different organizations have produced free downloadable um, PDFs of disability awareness activities. Um, they're just, uh, they're great because they're free and they're available, but there's just like no, you don't get any support with it. There's no, you, sometimes I kind of question the scaffolding of it, but if you just Google disability awareness, there are a few um, uh, things that have been put out. Um, service dog organizations often have stuff. Special Olympics has stuff. Um, there's a lot out there and I'll go over some more resources later on. But how do we take these resources and integrate them into what we're doing? I always suggest by starting with any sort of SEL program that your school is already using. Disability awareness is social emotional learning. It fulfills all the same requirements of social emotional learning. So think about ways that your disability awareness could fit into perhaps second step. So if your school is using second step, and maybe the teachers in your school are mandated to do it one day a week or something like that. Maybe every third week, instead of holding up the card and doing the second step discussion, you do a disability awareness activity instead. Right? And we're not adding anything more. They already have the time carved down in their schedule. They're already mandated to do second step or another SEL program, but we're just we're mixing it up a little bit. Every X number of times, they're doing a disability awareness um, activity instead. Um, if your school is doing responsive classroom or any sort of multi-tiered systems of support, um, again, we're already using those systems. Why not just embed disability awareness into it? Um, whether, you know, maybe there's um, some small group work you're, you're doing around MTSS with a small group of students, you know, doing disability awareness with those students. Responsive classroom, you're doing morning meeting. You're doing a closing circle. Those are times set aside, carved out in the schedule where you could be implementing some disability awareness uh, activities. So maybe morning meeting, every Friday at morning meeting, you show one of those really awesome short videos I showed you earlier and have the kids do a discussion instead of playing musical chairs or whatever, mm -hmm. right? Again, the time is there. It's how we choose to use the time. And it's about providing educators with the resources so they don't have to go and find them, that they don't have to be up to 1 a.m. on Pinterest trying to figure out what book to read. So we've got morning meeting time, closing circle time. Um, in a lot of schools nowadays, there seems to be a school counselor, a school social worker, an SEL interventionist that is going into classrooms once a week or for a chunk, a period of time. Again, they could be using disability in those, disability awareness in those times. And sometimes those folks have curriculums that they're using, other times they don't. They're kind of just like making stuff up on the fly. Why not give them disability awareness resources? Give them, here's a book list of all these great picture books that you could read related to disability awareness. They're in the classroom anyway. They might as well do this. And we were talking earlier about kind of that low to high risk ladder, and I was giving those examples of like things kids could share with each other. Those take 30 seconds. You could do those at morning meeting. You could, at closing circle, be saying to students, all right, before we leave today, before we get on the bus to go home, we're all gonna go around and do a quick share about something. Um, so there is, there's that time to do it. We have to think about it in those very intentional ways. Um, I would say literature is one of the easiest ways to embed disability awareness into the core curriculum. So whether your school is doing guided reading group, reader's workshop, um, middle and high school, if they're just asked to read X number of books, 
Um, like I know at Changing Perspectives, we've put together book lists by grade and by disability category. At the elementary school level, you could be doing a picture book. You could read Ben is Awesome, Ben Has Autism, and then have a discussion. Or read a picture book. Students have to do a response to text writing where they hear text and then have to do a written prompt. Why not read a picture book that has to do with disability awareness and then start writing? For guided reading groups, they're either told, like, pick any book or here's a set of books. Why not say, here's a set of books you can choose from? Out of my mind, wonder, fish in a tree, Al Capone does my shirts, anything but temp typical. Um, Oh, there's so many, right? The list goes on and on of these books that they could pick. Chapter books. At the middle or the high school level, why not? We, I worked with one school, and they did their summer reading program, was focused just on books with characters with disabilities. So before kids went on summer break, we did this big assembly to kind of kick it off. Then they had to read these books over with a summer break. And then the fall, when they came back, we invited in some people from the community with disabilities to share their story as kind of like a kickoff for the year. Um, at the middle and high school level, too, you could do something where you give kids, um, uh, you do like a bulletin board in the front of your school. And you cut out little, uh, whatever your school mascot is, little templates. You give kids a list of books. For every book you read, from this list, focusing on people with disabilities, characters with disabilities, you write your name on this little thing, you put it on the bulletin board, and then we put all your names in a bucket, and we pick one, and someone wins a free pizza or something like that. Again, there's ways to do it to make it fun, to make it engaging, to encourage students to do it, to build empathy, to build inclusion in your school. You're really not adding anything else. Kids have to read anyway. Why not do a really cool bulletin board and incentivize them with a $20 gift certificate to Domino's, right? Like that goes a long way when you're 13, 14, 15 years old. <laughs> Social studies, diversity. We've had a few schools embed this as part of social studies, especially like January, like Martin Luther King Day time, where they're talking about diversity and it tends to be racial diversity. Why not talk about disability as another form of diversity? Again, we have the time in social studies, these allocated blocks of time where we're talking about different types of people. Why not talk about the history around disability, the history around the ADA, history around policies about accessibility? Um, again, we can build disability awareness into it. Um, at the high school level, student council, advisory time, homeroom time, especially advisory and homeroom time, those tend to be kind of like dead times, right? Kids just hanging out on their phones, on Snapchat, and the teacher's just sitting up there doing whatever, right? Why not watch one of those videos and have a discussion? Um, there's ways that we can embed it. In our high school curriculum, we put together these activities called Spark 15 activities, which are 15-minute activities just to spark discussion, a quick little role play quick little discussion start, quick little disability brainstorm web um, on the, uh, the uh, chart paper, the smart board. Again, we have those times built in. Let's be really intentional about how we use it. So that's a lot right there. Um, like I said, I'm going to go through some case studies, and then we're going to have time just to chat about this and plan things out. So just keep absorbing, and you'll have time to talk in a minute. Oh, oh, the other thing that I would say, too, is that at the middle and the high school level, there are tons of really good videos now that you could do like a screening at your school, just an assembly. Um, just, it's very easy to plan. You're not, in, you know, bringing in guest speakers is great, but that takes more planning time. And sub schools just feel like, oh, we don't have the bandwidth. So um, Intelligent Lives is a great video. Has anyone seen that? So good. I saw it at South by Southwest EDU last year, and they had a panel discussion. So good. Intelligent Lives, including Samuel. Um, those are both made by the same filmmaker, Dan Habib, H-A-B-I-D, who's out of uh, University of New Hampshire, Institute of Disability. Um, I just started working with a filmmaker in Washington, DC, who has a film called The R Word, 
all about the R word and actually changing perspectives is writing the curriculum aligned with that film. Um, and she has a middle high school version of the R word and an elementary school version. Um, so those are three films that come to the top of my mind that you should definitely check out. Um, has anyone seen the show? Hang on one sec, let me finish my thought. Has anyone seen the show Speechless on ABC? So you should check out Speechless on ABC. There's episodes that you could totally show at the probably fifth grade and up. Um, it's on like the same, um, it's a comedy with Mindy Diver. And um, one of the characters, she has three kids in the show. And her middle son has cerebral palsy. And he's nonverbal um, and uses a communication device. It's really funny. And there's a lot of really good stuff. There's a way, it's, it's a way to like do disability awareness and not even know you're like doing disability awareness. Um, have people seen Atypical, the Netflix original? So that's a great one. Um, oh, I just watched a great one on um, Hulu, I think it was, Far From the Tree. It's a really good one. Um, and again, some of these could be good just to share with your colleagues. So there's a lot of videos out there. And again, it doesn't take much time to organize an assembly at your school and show a video to the students. Yes, sorry. Thank you for letting me finish my thought. I'm including Samuel. Yeah, you're welcome. And all of those have websites. And again, I'm, I'm hoping to give you about a half an hour to work. So if you have computers, feel free to go on and start looking that stuff up. Oh. So we actually only don't have a half hour. OK. Thank you for telling me. I just had 1230 in my head. Oh, by the way, that's food for the next event. <laughs> <laughs> I'm standing here to block it. All right. So we <laughs> might. All right. Then I'm going to go through this as quick as I can. Thank you, Kathy, for letting me know. You're welcome. We just get so excited about this stuff. We could do this all day. All right. Um, so a couple examples of things to think about. Um, this school did disability awareness um, where classroom teachers did the implementation. They did it for a designated amount of time. Um, so they did six weeks where every week a teacher was expected to do X number of disability awareness activities. That could be a whole lesson. It could be going to understood.org and doing some simulation activities. It could be watching a video. It could be reading a picture book and having a discussion. Um, so it could be a combination of different things. Um, teachers had the ability to customize it. And then they ended it with some sort of culminating event. Um, I'll say this much. Bringing in guest speakers and doing disability simulation activities are great. They are most effective if you do that after you've done a lot of learning. A lot of schools want to like kick it off with a guest speaker or kick it off with disability simulation activities. You could do that, but then you're kind of working backwards. right? We want to do the learning. We want to create environments to talk about these issues in safe and respectful ways. We want to give students the language. We want to help them use person-first language. We want to help develop the language and the accessibility to the content. So when they do these simulation activities, or they have guest speakers come in and share their stories, the students already have the language around disability. They've already been conditioned about how we talk about these things. The teachers already feel comfortable facilitating these conversations and these activities. So I would highly recommend that you do learning first, whether that's through changing perspectives or other lessons, books, and videos, and then doing the simulation activities and guest speakers. And oftentimes, if you're rolling it out at a school level, if you have some sort of culminating event on the calendar, that helps teachers see what they're building towards. So if you say to teachers, OK, on February 10th, we're going to do this great big event. We're asking you to do these lessons or read these books or encourage your students to do x, y, and z leading up to it. Teachers go, OK, like I get what I'm building towards. Case study number two. This was a school that implemented things through a school counselor. Um, so the school counselor was going classroom to classroom. Um, they focused on very specific disabilities. Um, and then at the end, they did a culminating event. But the culminating they didn't, did here was really cool. 
they actually had the kids create projects about disability and then invited parents to come into the school and visit those projects. So they started out by having students kind of welcome the parents and do like an opening assembly, describing to the parents what they learned about, why they learned about it, why it was important. Then they split the parents up into groups and the parents went to different classrooms and there in the classroom the students facilitated some learning um, and some activities with the parents. Really, really cool. We've had some other schools where um, an elementary school works with a local middle or high school where the middle and high school students come down to the elementary school and facilitate those activities, read books with the students. Um, one thing that can be really powerful is that when you're thinking about guest speakers, looking within your own building or other buildings. So maybe there's a student that graduate who's in ninth grade who has a disability who, want, who needs community service hours anyway, goes down to the elementary school and shares his or her story with the younger students. Again, there's a lot of resources that you have right here, and you just have to help people think about how they can use them. And then literature, as I mentioned, there's tons and tons of books out there um, that you can use to uh, help embed this into your ELA. OK, so I went through that really fast. Um, and so here's, we don't have a ton of time. Um, so what I was going to do was ask you to take some time and use that green chart and think about these questions and take notes and start planning out. I'm wondering what, we have 10 minutes left. So I'm wondering what is the best use of our time. I could give you just like five minutes to work a little bit with your group so we could just kind of come together at the end, or would it be better to use the last 10 minutes just as a whole group share out? Do people have a preference? Awesome, let's do that. All right, so let's use the last 10 minutes um, to talk as a big group here. Um, you can share out questions, if you want me to repeat any resources, concerns. Again, you all have my contact information. I'm more than happy to set up um, you know, s separate conversations individually. But what are people thinking? I don't want to forget our raffle either. OK. <laughs> so we will do that in four and a half, five minutes. Okay. I just saw an orange ticket, and I'm like, oh, we can't forget that. <laughs> I've been known to do that. <laughs> so is anybody thinking about a way that they might incorporate this right now in their school? I thought that would be the first question. Yeah. Tell me more what you mean when you say co-teaching. What model are you using? Uh, when there is a main, I'm at the high school level, yeah, I'm at the high school level, so a, a, a gen ed teacher and then uh, a special education teacher in the same room. With students with and without disabilities? Yeah. Okay. Um, I would say it, I would say it starts with changing adult perspectives first. I would say it starts there because I think sometimes, especially at the high school level where you're a little more segregated in terms of tracks that kids are on, that the gen ed teacher might have some preconceived notions, stereotypes, bias about students with disabilities. They might come to it from more of a sympathetic perspective than an empathetic perspective. So I would say it starts there. Um, and then at the high school level, you have to be so tricky with these conversations, too, because the younger kids are, the more willing they are to share. The older they get, the less willing they are to share. So I think it's really going back to that low to high risk conversation. Now, obviously, at the high school level, you might not be doing your favorite color. You might ramp it up a little bit. But I would say really thinking about it in a slow, drawn out way um, is really important in building building community universally before you start talking about disability specifically. Yeah. You mentioned a lot of chapter books for like middle school and high school mm -hmm. um, that talk about like empathy and disabilities and whatnot. How about for like younger children? How about what? How about for like younger children around like preschool and 
We have tons of picture books too. Yeah, there's tons of picture books out there. Um, so Ben has autism, Ben is awesome is one. Um, when my worries get too big about anxiety, there's one called Why is Dad So Mad and Why is Mom So Scared about um, kind of trauma, PTSD, things of that nature. There's a series of books by an author by the or an, a, an a, author by the name of Barbara Esham, E S H A M. So there's um, they're all about learning disabilities. Um, Enemy Pie is one of my favorite ones. That's just about kindness and inclusion and acceptance. Uh, Enemy Pie. Enemy, like you're my enemy, pie, like I eat pie. What was the author's name again? Uh, Esham, E-S-H-A-M. And if you on Amazon just start like looking up some of these titles, it'll you know give you the related ones. So there's tons of picture books, and there's kind of been a surge in both picture and chapter books focusing on characters with disabilities. Um, we discussed the empathy, and then also, you know, Empathy is a parallel process as well. So as a program director, I just want the teachers, to, well, we are the inclusive program, we have to do it. It doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to start from hearing from them, their perspective. So I mean, if anybody has a suggestion where to start, the good start, because I think step one, they have to re-emphasize that well, right? So why are they becoming exclusive sometimes? But their voice has to be heard as well. So I mean, just thinking about the way they start. Definitely, yeah. You know, with anything, you have to make sure you get the buy-in from the staff, right? Um, and so figuring out what their perspective is on this from the beginning, giving, challenging their perspective at the same time, helping them to see the benefits of doing this work. Um, but getting the buy-in is, is always, you know, if teachers are engaged and energized and excited about doing this work, the way in which they present it to students is going to be more engaging and resonate with students. You're going to have greater outcomes from the beginning. Um, so definitely something to consider. parents' education to hear about inclusion program. So we say for the, for the beneficial, for the kids, in the, you know, for the teacher, if we, we, uh, we part of we need to give the teacher education, and also we need to have parents that the parents understand the importance of the inclusive, inclusive program for the, for the environment. So do you have any suggestion in that the parents' education we can offer in the center? I think one of the problems, as I talked about earlier, right, we're trying to change behavior. We need to change attitudes. We need to build awareness. That model, I believe, works with parents and other educators, right? And I think the challenge sometimes in schools is that we'll do like one parent evening. Like we'll do one two hour parent evening and that's it. Now, there's always scheduling constraints and whatever, but you're not going to change behavior in, two, in one parent evening, right? You might start building that awareness. So I think the key is to think about it in the same way that you're thinking about it with kids. And somehow, and again, there's scheduling constraints and resources and time, but somehow figuring out a way that you're providing more resources and more education opportunities for parents. Whether that's you know, some morning coffees, whether that's like, um, like what one of the things we did with our parent programs at Changing Perspectives is we put together, um, we found a whole bunch of articles around these topics and we made them PDFs that teachers could print out and just send home to parents. So pro providing parents with you know, evidence-based resources that they can read on their own time um, to, to build their awareness and their understanding to then transfer to the other areas. All right, we're gonna do our raffle. Um, we also have like people trying to get in, and I'm trying to hold the food. Back. Oh my gosh! So, All right, it blame it on me. It's exciting. <laughs> um, I did not understand that it was a raffle. I thought if it had an orange ticket that they won. So that gal Sabisa who just left, I thought she won. So I gave her a calendar. So I'm okay. really sorry. Oh. But we'll move forward. We at least have one more calendar to raffle. Yes. Yes. And, and why don't you share what you do, Christine? 
It's, it's just a, it's just another tool. Uh, we created this. My husband and I are both special education teachers, I'm a school teacher, um, and it's another tool for your arsenal. Uh, there's 13 disabilities. There's 12 months in a year, so each month is a different disability with uh, educational challenges and institutions for each. Um, and we tailor this so you can get these back number and calendars and highlighting the disability every month. So it's not Amazon, but then you know we're really trying to reach out to it's just people to spread awareness. All right, it's exciting. And you can get it on Amazon. Yeah. Yeah. So you have information here for us. And then you're going to do a raffle? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> I'm not going to even get near it. Sam, is this your email? CPNG? Uh, Sam at CPNE. E like an egg. Savita run the other one. Yay! <laughs> Savita, though, actually pilots his project just down the street. She's an OT, and so it's just been really fun. She didn't even get permission to get here until like 8 o'clock today. So she was here, and she showed me her ticket, and I thought that meant she won. So we'd love everyone to complete their, so I apologize, complete your evaluation. Uh, we are videotaping this. Isn't this exciting? So exciting. So hopefully we can um, have this to access for future. And again, um, we'll put it on our website, um, and we're delighted that we were able to have Sam get here. Thank you. So as you're finishing your evaluation, I'll just wrap up by saying thank you for being here. I hope that this inspired you to think about empathy education and disability awareness in perhaps new ways. I know that sometimes this challenges people um, in the way in which they have been doing things or pushes people. Um, in, in terms of a vulnerable standpoint and thinking about their own experiences with disability. Um, but please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'm always happy to, to share resources with you. That's my email. It's also in the packet. We are actively looking to engage some more schools in this area in our curriculum. So if you're interested, let me know. We'll figure out a way to make it work. Um, and I hope you all have a great rest of your day um, and a successful and positive school year. Thank you.